Hi, this is John Linneball from John Linneball Tutoring, and this is AP U.S. History Video 22, Colonial Responses to British Policies from Protests to the Revolutionary War. If you like this video, please don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. And if you don't like the ads, you can always try testpreparation.locals.com, where all these videos are available without any ads. Colonial Resistance to Post-French and Indian War British Policies As discussed in the previous videos in this series, such as videos 18 and 20, the French and Indian War led to increased taxes and increased attempts by the British to control the American colonies in general. This led to resentments by the colonists for injustices, real or imagined, that the British committed against them by instituting these policies. These resentments led to a resistance movement among the colonists, and that movement then evolved into an independence movement. The Stamp Act Congress. The first major coordinated protests against the British policies were protests against the Stamp Act. See video 20, and we'll have links up here. In October 1765, delegates from nine colonies met in New York and drew up a list of complaints that went beyond the Stamp Act. The declarations of the Stamp Act Congress asserted that only colonial legislatures could tax the colonists, so no taxation without representation. Historians mark this as the beginning of the Revolutionary War, which lasted from 1765 to 1783. The Virginia Resolves and Virtual Representation. The Virginia Resolves were similar to Patrick Henry's, well, Patrick Henry's Virginia Resolves were similar to the Declarations of the Stamp Act Congress, is what I'm trying to get at here. And the Virginia Resolves were adopted only in part by the Virginia House of Burgesses, but they were published and distributed in whole throughout the colonies. Debated in June 1765, the Virginia Resolves went far in their demands for colonial self-government. The main point was that only the colonial government could tax colonies. The virtual representation was British response. It was the British's response to no taxation without representation. The idea was members of parliament all represent the entire British empire, so no specific representatives are needed for or designated for any particular region. So some cities such as San Francisco, California have had a similar system where council members slash alder persons or select persons, etc., are voted in at large rather than by a neighborhood. And if you're interested, you can see the link below for district elections in San Francisco, a brief history history where it describes such a system where it went from at-large members to members representing individual districts and that was a huge struggle over the years in San Francisco but I digress committees of correspondence all through the colonies, communities formed committees of correspondence starting in 1764. These groups of British policy opponents initially distributed information and coordinated actions against British policies. By the 1770s, they had practically become shadow governments in the colonies. They often took over the powers and challenged the legitimacy of colonial legislatures and royal governors. So here we have a plaque where Louis XIV of actually this would be Louis the 16th rather sorry of France met with Benjamin Franklin and the secret committee of correspondence of the Continental Congress thus inaugurating the move towards a French alliance here so this was in 1775 and Louis XVI so that would have to be Louis the 16th all right so this was dedicated in 1983 the bicentennial of the signing of the Treaty of Paris excellent Crowds of protesters, often called Sons of Liberty, harassed and occasionally attacked merchants who carried British imported goods. These were actions by crowds. Stores in cities and towns were sometimes looted if they did not honor the boycott of British goods. Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor Thomas Hutchinson, who was appointed by the British, uh, his Boston home was also looted and damaged. While the Stamp Act was repealed in 1766, colonial relations with the British deteriorated in a series of British moves and colonial reactions. Notice that the term crowd action connotes some kind of organization, whereas mob notes indicate, sorry, mob action indicates an unruly group of people getting out of control. Word choice matters. So a connotation is, it's kind of an unwritten, subtle meaning. So if you describe someone as a Boy Scout, a Boy Scout is someone who's literally a member of the Boy Scouts of America. A, someone, if you describe someone as a lowercase Boy Scout, you might mean a goody two-shoes. Oh, he never does anything bad. He's a real Boy Scout, that sort of thing. So think of mob action 
mob sounds like something that's just out of control and formed on the spot uh, whereas a crowd could just be a crowd of people who've all come in an organized way think of people who've come to watch a football game or a political rally or something like that so or you can think organized crime versus the mob organized crime hey it's got organized right in the name must be organized the mob again just sounds like a bunch of people who've gotten together to be thugs and commit crimes so I'd always wondered about that. It's like, well, how can the mafia be the mob and organized crime? If it's a mob, it's not organized. But I digress. Let's move on. The Townsend's Acts. Passed in the wake of the disastrous Stamp Act, the Townsend's Acts were taxes on glass, lead, paint, paper, and tea that were designed specifically ex as external taxes on imports into the colonies rather than taxes on goods produced in the colonies. So the reason that they would want to be designated as external taxes, why Parliament would want them to be, to be designated as external taxes, is we've already seen from the declarations of the Stamp Act Congress and the Virginia Resolves that the protest against the taxes were, were supposedly, supposedly is what I'm trying to say, based upon the idea that only the colonial legislatures could tax the colonies and therefore anything that was an internal tax on things produced in the colonies etc was unconstitutional and a usurpation or taking over of the responsibilities and rights of the colonial legislatures and here we see in letters from a farmer in pennsylvania that were written by a pennsylvania lawyer and legislator john dickinson using the pseudonym a farmer in opposition to the Townsend Act, well, or Townsend Acts, it should be. Anyway, the idea was that taxes were imposed merely to raise revenue and that they were unconstitutional for that reason because only legislatures could tax the colonies for revenue. So Mr. Dickinson, under the pseudonym Off Farmer, how original, anyway, was just trying to say that I don't care if you're saying they're to yeah, regulate trade they're not external because you're taxing things that are internal and you're taking over powers that belong to the colonial legislatures that was news to the British who said no we've always been doing this this way why are you bothering us just pay your taxes you stupid colonists anyway as all import taxes or tariffs do these encouraged local productions of the same goods or substitutes for them if there were taxes on imported lead and glass and paint then if you could make lead glass and paint in the colonies it was a really good idea to do so because you could save money and colonists saw simple colonial goods as virtuous substitutes for extravagant British imports. Some colonial women made homespun clothing, etc., as British imports became unfashionable. The Boston Massacre. After rioting in 1768, Britain dispatched troops to Boston following rioting there that year. Bostonians found the troops' presence upsetting and, as a standing army, threatening their freedom. The idea was that while armies should be raised for war, they should be deactivated in times of peace. British soldiers also competed with Bostonians for jobs. Troops earned part-time wages, and they were expected by Parliament, etc., to earn extra money to support themselves in the colonies. You can learn more about that by watching video 21. In winter 1770, the British soldiers and Bostonians had an armed conflict, which was started when a wig maker's apprentice and a British sentry who was on patrol doing his job had an argument which resulted in colonists tossing stones at troops who were sent to restore order during that little skirmish. The troops shot five colonists, including a black man named Crispus Attucks. The news spread throughout the colonies and was used as propaganda against the British. Thus the name Massacre five people getting shot it's a massacre look what the british are doing to us so that would be propaganda against the british used in the other colonies and here's a little illustration and you can see that it was printed and sold by paul revere of the british's coming fame the midnight ride and a little note on standing armies having full-time professional armies was not seen as desirable by the british or the american colonists or colonies of that time the british colonists well the british whether they were colonists or not were very suspicious of such armies and that was actually popular thought into the first half of this 
century, the now deceased late great author Kurt Vonnegut mentioned that when he was in you know, grade school in the 1920s, that his history teacher said, well, the reason America was doing so well compared to European countries is because they didn't pay all this extra money for standing armies. Today, most countries have a professional military that is standing armies, and military spending is a huge portion of the U.S. budget today. The U.S. has the biggest military in the world by far, and you can see that military spending is about 53% of the budget. And if you include veterans benefits, that's another six, so that's past military. So arguably you could say at least 59% of the huge federal budget is military spending since discretionary, it's 1.16. So it's a little bit more than $500 billion every year being spent on the military. Um, actually close to about 600 billion. But let's get on with this. The Gaspé Affair, or Gaspé Affair, depending on how you pronounce it. The following the Boston Massacre, tensions between the British and colonists appeared to relax in the early 1770s. However, resentments against British officials still simmered beneath the surface. The Gaspé, a British revenue schooner seeking smugglers, ran aground near Warwick, Rhode Island in 1772. The schooner was looted and burned by colonists who found it. This marked the transition by protesters from relatively peaceful to more violent and militant tactics. Well, yeah, seizing and looting a schooner, definitely rather violent. And burning it, too. Okay, so anyway, that was rather militant. The Tea Act, the Boston Tea Party. In 1773, the British passed the Tea Act to support the failing British East India Tea Company. Sounds a little Trump-like, doesn't it? Oh, you can see ancient tweets if they had it back then. The failing British India Tea Company. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So, basically, tea from that company was untaxed while all others' tea was taxed. That allowed the company to undercut the prices of local merchants and smugglers. While the Tea Act actually lowered tea prices in Boston because the British East India Tea Company could sell it cheaply, uh, Bostonians were outraged by Parliament's favoritism towards one particular company. Does that remind you of any particular corporate bailouts by Congress? Well, take a look at recent history over the last eh, 20, 30, 40 years, and you might learn a few things about certain corporations getting tax breaks where other ones don't or corporations and Wall Street in general getting tax breaks that Joe, John Q. Public on Main Street doesn't get. Bostonians, many dressed as Native Americans or in other disguises, dumped cases of the company's tea into Boston Harbor, both for its symbolic and financial, roughly four million in today's dollars value. Yeah, that's a lot of tea. The Intolerable Acts, also known as the Coercive Acts. Coercive means forcing someone to do something. The Intolerable Acts were passed in 1774, mostly to crack down on the colonists. The Massachusetts Government Act was one of those acts. It put Massachusetts under direct British control, limited powers of town meetings. You can see the video regarding town halls and allowed colonial governors to replace elected officials with appointees. The Administration of Justice Act allowed trials to be moved from colonies to Britain and arguably violated the right to a trial by jury of one's peers, which was an established right in British law even before the United States put it into the Constitution. So you'd say, well, my peers are other colonists, not people who live in Great Britain. Therefore, the Administration of Justice Act violate my right as a colonist. The Boston Port Act closed Boston Harbor to trade until further notice, and the Quartering Act expanded the 1765 Quartering Act, which required Bostonians to quarter British troops upon notice. And the fifth and final act, the Quebec Act, allowed French Catholics to practice the religion freely in Quebec, which really had nothing to do with Massachusetts, but it annoyed Bostonians who, by today's standards, oddly saw that as an infringement on their religion. So yeah, closing Boston Harbor so people can't trade, which was obviously a huge part of the economy of Boston. That's why Boston was there, because it's by a gigantic harbor, so they can trade. And then requiring people to quarter British troops on notice. That's pretty annoying. Also, putting Massachusetts under direct control. So four out of five were really obnoxious laws, and the fifth one, well, that's just kind of a historical artifact. 
Revolution at the top and bottom. While we all know of the traditional revolutionary war heroes such as Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, etc., we also need to note that women, laborers, and artisans also played key roles in the revolution, as you may have suspected. Since you can't really have a war effort with only the high-ranking leaders, and you can't even have a war or any kind of war effort, with just an army and a navy, you need lots of people who are providing material support for the army and the navy and doing lots of little things that uh, are not exactly sung of in the history books or recorded with positive uh, thoughts in the history books. You know, In World War II, they would call that the man behind the man behind the gun or the woman behind the man behind the gun is someone has to support the troops. Women in the American Revolution. Women made clothing to enable the British boycotts and provide troop uniforms. And women also took part in crowd actions against merchants. Remember the Sons of Liberty, who were believed to be holding back goods to profiteer from wartime shortages. So that was different from the Sons of Liberty, but similar in that, okay, if people were holding back goods because they're like, ah, prices really increase, so if I hold these back, I can let them out a little at a time and sell them for a lot more money than if I just made them commonly available. Patriot women formed the Daughters of Liberty in 1765 as a complement to the Sons of Liberty against the Stamp Act and continued to organize boycotts, spinning bees, where presumably they would spin cloth, etc., you know, yarn, cloth, to make clothing, and continued to organize public protests through the 1770s. During the Tea Act crisis of 1773, the Daughters of Liberty made alternatives to Chinese and Indian imported teas using things that they could obtain in the colonies. And 51 women in North Carolina started the Edenton Tea Party in 1774 when they signed a declaration refusing to use British products including tea. Women helped on battlefields as water carriers, such as Molly Pitcher at the Battle of Monmouth. You can see this picture here. And she, when her husband collapsed and couldn't man a cannon any further, she womaned the cannon, ha ha ha, you know, and took over. So she's kind of been celebrated for a very long time at the Battle of Monmouth and nurses. And Deborah Sampson disguised herself as a man and fought in some battles. So women served in all sorts of roles as water carriers, nurses, and sometimes even actually fighting soldiers themselves. Skilled and unskilled laborers in the American Revolution. Skilled laborers, artisans, for a long time were active against the British policies. They encouraged boycotts because they made the domestic alternatives to the products being boycotted, but economic interest was not the only reason for their participation in the revolution. Ideology was also a prime motive. Artisans had been radicalized over the years, which is good because artisans were necessary to win in street conflicts with the British. The colonial elite recognized artisans were solid allies for the revolution, and Ebenezer McIntosh, a Boston shoemaker, led crowd actions in the Stamp Act period. Artisans made up a significant portion of the militias and Continental Army units. Unskilled laborers were also a huge part of the revolutionary armed forces. In Philadelphia, radical artisans were essential to the revolutionary movement in 1776. The city's pre-war leadership, mostly members of the merchant class, opposed declaring independence and cutting off British trade. Artisans and laborers with Benjamin Rush and Thomas Paine among their leaders, created extra-legal committees and militia groups in support of the revolution. So extra-legal means basically not legally recognized or perhaps illegal. Anyway, they supported the revolution, and one achievement was drafting the Pennsylvania Constitution, the most democratic constitution among the new states. Funding the war effort. Civilians did what they could to aid the revolutionary army financially and materially, but this aid was insufficient to prevent material shortages for the patriots, that is the revolutionary soldiers, against the war. Inflation, currency, and other monetary problems. The Continental Army was constantly underfunded, often low on basic supplies. As most wars do, the war involved tremendous spending and organization, tasks for which the new Congress was not prepared. Congress printed money to pay debts, but the money lost its value to runaway inflation. Merchants vastly preferred to sell to the British, who paid in silver and gold instead of worthless paper money. Many of Washington's army's problems, 
That is such as virtual starvation at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania during the winter of 1777 to 1778 were caused by the fact that merchants wouldn't accept Congress's paper money or simply refused to do business with the uh, patriots. Inflation, currency, and other monetary problems continued. One solution was Congress's issuance of frontier land grants to troops instead of the monetary payment. The troops often used these grants as money since their most immediate need was not an interest in unsettled land. Food, clothing, and shelter now beats an interest in wilderness, unsettled real estate in the future. As stated before, women made homespun clothing for the army, and men also provided whatever material support they could. Local committees did attempt to fix prices for necessary good, that is, set these prices of these goods at a, a price that is not moving, it's fixed. It can't be changed without permission to defeat inflation. So they tried to fix prices to defeat inflation which would be tried at other times in American history with eh, mixed success. But anyway, crucial factors in the Patriot victory. Tensions reached a breaking point by 1775. The battles of Lexington and Concord occurred that year and fighting got worse after the Second Continental Congress declared independence in 1776. Several factors led to the victory of the Patriot cause, which was by no means certain. No guarantee the Patriots would win, and there's a very good reason to believe that the British would win this war. The Patriots had excellent leadership under General George Washington, who led several key generals, most notably Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox. European volunteer officers also helped, such as Marquis de Lafayette from France, Baron von Steuben, probably pronounced Baron von Steuben, who was Prussian, you know, part of Germany before there was a Germany, and Thaddeus Kosciuszko and Kazimierz Pulaski, who were both Polish. Lexington and Concord. The shot heard around the world started a battle between colonists and British troops in April 1775. The battle took place in the towns of Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts. This was the shift from tensions to outright warfare between the colonists and the British troops. More factors in the outcome of the war. Both sides had significant advantages and disadvantages in the Revolutionary War. The British had a well-trained professional army, the strongest navy in the world, financial resources, and the support of about a third of the colonial population. British also, well, the British, rather, not British, anyway, the British, or Britain, had the support of most native tribes and also promised freedom to slaves who joined their cause. However, the Patriots had the advantage of being on their home soil, whereas the British were far from home. All the Patriots had to do was get their British, not get their British, get the British to leave. They did not have to conquer Britain. Furthermore, the Patriots were committed to their cause in the way occupying British troops were not. Most Redcoats probably just wanted to return to Britain alive and mostly uninjured. The Patriots did lack financing, as noted previously, and had no central authority. So those were disadvantages to the Patriots, but they managed to win. Defensive versus offensive war. This would be an advantage to the Patriots. It's much easier for people to defend their home territory than invade the and occupy the territory of others. As I mentioned, British troops probably just mostly wanted to go home, so they didn't really fight as if they're... Their lives depended on it, unless they literally, their lives depended on it, because, hey, as long as they could get home, they'd be okay. But if you actually lived in the United States at that time, you'd be like, uh, this is my homeland, I really need you to get out so I can live my life. Yeah, such an advantage does not always guarantee victory to the home team, such as the U.S. Civil War. I mean, the South did lose, even though obviously the Southerners lived in the South. But it is a factor in any war. For example, Hitler's disastrous for Germany attack on the Soviet Union in World War II. Didn't he, Hitler didn't really understand what you needed to do to invade Russia, especially if it lasted into the winter. Russia is very inhospitable in the winter, especially if you don't already have your home and everything all set up. So this should tell you something about whether the U.S. invasions and occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan were good ideas or not. Urban versus rural areas. As the war progressed, the U.S. troops learned it is easier to control urban areas than rural areas, knowledge it would use during the Vietnam War, but it wasn't enough to win that war. This should also tell you about something, whether the U.S. invasions and occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan were good ideas or not. 
it's easy for an invading army to control the cities. It's really hard for them to control the countryside. And we're on two phases of the war. Historians generally separate the Revolutionary War into three phases. The first phase, 1775 to 1776, was fought in New England. The British did not understand the depth of pro-independence feeling. The British believed the war was just trouble caused by some angry colonists that would subside if they just dealt with it quickly, properly, and harshly, and then everybody else would fall into line. The second phase, 1776 to 1778, took place in the middle colonies, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. The British believed controlling New York would force New England to fall into line. The huge British force drove George Washington and his army out of New York City in the summer of 1776. The British attacking New York from Canada lost badly at the Battle of Saratoga in October 1777. Saratoga made it clear the British could hold the cities but not rural areas, as we just discussed. People are too spread out, etc. And also showed France the Patriots could actually win battles. The French recognized the United States officially as a country and later provided support. Notice this was because the French really hated the British, not so much because they supported the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Phases of the war continued. Third phase was 1778 to 1783, fought in the South. There was loyalist sentiment that was very strong in the South, and the British hoped to exploit the resentment of the slaves at their being slaves. Although the British won battles at Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston, South Carolina, the British plans to win the South, and thus the war, failed. In the North, the war reached a stalemate where nobody could really win, although the British had information given to them by the traitorous General Benedict Arnold in 1780. In October 1781, a joint American-French expedition caught British General Cornwallis unprepared, causing Cornwallis to surrender at Yorktown, Virginia. The skirmishes continued until the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783, ending the war. The Treaties of Paris and the Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War was ended by the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Notice that there are other agreements also named the Treaty of Paris that you have to know. So pay attention to the time, etc. referred to in questions about the Treaty of Paris. Another Treaty of Paris was the end of the French and Indian War, which was in 1763, and yet another Treaty of Paris was at the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898. Did you find this video useful? Well, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why do I care? Well, basically because YouTube won't let me share any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of view time in a year. And while many people are watching these, I don't have 4,000 hours of watch time. I also don't have 1,000 subscribers quite yet. Getting close, but don't have it yet. If you want to see this without ads, again, go to testpreparation.locals.com and sign up there. It costs a little bit of money, but it's worth it. And for the same reasons, you're not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I'm always happy to read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. And I reserve the right to delete comments from and block those who specialize in destructive criticism or things that are off topic. You can hire me for tutoring if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area and subject to social distancing, etc. requirements we can meet in person. Or I can meet you anywhere if you want to meet through Zoom or some other video conferencing. Thanks for watching. Here's how to contact me via Facebook, Instagram, email, and phone. You can pause this if you need this information. And finally, this is not a substitute for your classes, text, etc. This video is based upon Barron's AP United States History Review Book, any other sources listed in the video description, and my general knowledge of U.S. history. So a lot of Wikipedia entries as well as the AP U.S. History Review Book. While this should help you do well in the AP U.S. History exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about in his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please read your class text and pay attention to what your teacher says in class. All right, thanks.